It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, so you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons, presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. Use the question panel on the webinar to submit your questions. Or you can hop on Twitter. Submit your questions with hashtag event icons. We'll be answering your questions live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better conversation we can have. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter and Facebook. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event icons.com. Com. Now, without any further delay, this is Hashtag Event Icons. Thanks for joining us today. We are very excited to have uh, Babs Nijdam. Hmm, hopefully I probably said that totally wrong. Uh, and Cindy Lowe with us today. We're going to be talking about alternative venues. And I couldn't think of two people more qualified to do this. So... Alternative venues, of course, destination, the venue, they're the bones, and they're really they're the foundation of our events. And choosing alternative venues offers so many opportunities and sometimes some challenges. So sometimes we know that alternative venues are designed with events in mind. Some grow to become more event friendly. We're going to talk about that today. Some were never meant to be venues. <laughs> so this dynamic duo has years of experience uh, in North America and in Europe. And we're very excited today because we are actually representing three countries today. So Canada with me, and of course the US with uh, Cindy, and Holland, the Netherlands today uh, with Babs. So welcome, you guys. I'm going to let you introduce yourselves. There, you know, we have some intros here, but not so, not so, not so always so interesting. So we'll start with you, uh, Cindy, and you just tell us about yourself. What got you into the events industry? Sounds good. Hi, everyone. I'm from Austin, Texas, down in hot Texas. Um, I've been in the events industry for almost 16 years. I own Red Velvet Events. We're headquartered here in Austin. We are a full service creative events agency and a preferred Austin DMC. Um, what got me into the industry is actually a little bit of a happy accident. Um, I fell into it 16 years ago, uh, switching over from the tech side. So I used to be actually a software consultant and I programmed for a living. And now for the last 16 years, I've been producing and now selling events and helping people make their dreams uh, productions for corporate. <laughs> that is fantastic. Welcome. Um, I'm also going to just say, Cindy, you also wrote a book this year too. That's called Behind, Behind the, the Red, Red Velvet Velvet. Curtain. Yes, I, love it. I know. Um, you to check it out. Y'all can include the link later. <laughs> we will absolutely include that link later. So, Babs, tell us about you. What got you into the events industry? Um, so, hi, I'm Babs. I work as, for a consultancy and we help alternative venues grow their business and revenues for, in the events industry. Um, I actually got into the events business because I wanted to work internationally. I I am Dutch, but have an international background and I was working locally and I was getting pretty frustrated with just working with Dutch people. So I wanted to open up the world um, and I got the opportunity work, to work for, well, the biggest uh, uh, venue in the Netherlands, the Rye Amsterdam Convention Center. And I was there for about seven years and then I thought I want to go on my own and do other things and um, yeah, so that's how I, with an industry pal, I'm now a partner in a company and um, yeah, so it's it's great to be uh, entrepreneurs now and um, yes. be our own buses. You are, so, and that of course is Sammy Allen and it's Sequoia Events. And yes, so, you know, this is like the dynamic blonde duo of Europe taking it by storm and from an alternative venue perspective. So let's start with Babs. What would you be doing if you weren't in the events industry? I saw that question. Uh, <laughs> uh, I really don't, uh, I really don't know. I think my, I started international business and I always, I, when I was younger, I wanted to become a lawyer and I didn't, didn't do that either. And my mom always said, I think you need to get into the hospitality industry. Um, and I tried my best for a very long time not to do that. And I ended up in it. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would be doing anything else, to be honest. I think this is probably the industry I was meant to be working in. Me too. How about you, Cindy? I think you're I the, exactly the same, aren't you? Well, it was very tough. But I was like, you know, I bet you she wants something that's like not in the <laughs> I did think of, I was like, oh, I could do this. I could do that. 
Um, but there's just one thing that I think I would be very good at, which is a professional shopper. Oh, I love shopping yeah. and I love picking out details. And so if, if someone came to me and go, you know, I need a wardrobe change or I need to know how to dress for an interview or, you know, something of that nature, I would totally be up for the challenge. Oh, I need you this week. Somebody <laughs> said, we're going to do a photo shoot. Can you send us some pictures of the w outfits that you're thinking of? I was like, I to, what? <laughs> <laughs> So wait a minute, I need a lot more information before that happens. So I feel like I could really use you. Okay, so let's start with the basics. Um, alternative venues. So let's start, Cindy, how do you define alternative venue? So to me, when I think of alternative venues, when I hear a client request it, is that that means they don't want a hotel ballroom or they don't want a standard meeting space that's four walls. So that could mean, that could mean a bar in Austin. It could mean a, even a house. It could even mean a, a non-traditional patio that we have to convert into what I would call an event space that's usable. Now, um, Bab, you come from a very unique perspective on this, which is that Sequoia is actually helping alternative venues uh, look at how they're gonna become venues and to market themselves as well as be operationally sound, I would imagine. So, but you're, cause you are based on two continents. So Cindy, you are really dealing in Austin with a lot of, you know, an old venue would be, you know, 30 years old, much like Vancouver. Yeah. Um, you know, histor historic being very loosely used. Whereas <laughs> Babs, you're in a much different scenario in Europe where, you know, an old venue could be literally hundreds of years old. So what Babs are the kinds of alternative venues that you are, working with and seeing her out there um well i think pretty much at this point anything that that is a building that has four walls and a roof we find in europe could be defined as a unique and unusual venue as we say but that goes from churches museums old factories um bars and restaurants obviously uh, boats so, uh, you know, we have a lot of houseboats in Amsterdam. Some of them have turned a whole houseboat into uh, a meeting space. So basically, I think uh, old military complexes that have been turned into event spaces. So, I mean, pretty much anything, you can, anything that you can think of that has walls and roof can be <laughs> a venue at this point. So, yeah. <laughs> Now, does it really need walls and a roof? Can't we just, you know, start? Well, I don't know. Maybe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is that when an alternative venue becomes a tent? Which yes. Is actually generally like building a, about the same cost as building a small house quite often. Pretty so. much. <laughs> yeah. Right. So Cindy, what are the kinds of alternative venues that are in your neighborhood? So in Austin, this has actually been, I think, one of the key reasons why people love coming to Austin and doing meetings and events. Because it started out with, when South by Southwest started to become popular, people would buy out bars because we have a, a, an entertainment district called Sixth Street. Now we have eight entertainment districts in downtown. So you can pick out houses, bungalows, you can pick out a bar, you can pick out a, a patio, you can do all sorts of events. But it's the idea that it's not your traditional, yeah, hotel space. You just go in and, you know, you get your catering. And so uh, the things that I really have enjoyed actually is actually challenging uh, when a client comes to us and go, well, we are kind of, we have to stay in the hotel or we can't go too far. We actually will convert a hotel ballroom into the non <laughs> So one of the examples is our entertainment district is called Rainy Street. It's made up of a bunch of bungalow homes that have been converted into different themed bars. And because now there's also high rises there, we're no longer allowed to close off the street, but a lot of people want these block parties. And if they already have a contract with the hotel and the hotel minimum, we will actually recreate that bar scene and that uh, uh, rainy street experience in the hotel ballroom. So we are basically recreating so that you don't see the air walls. You don't see that it's uh, the ballroom chandelier. You are feeling like you're outside, but you're really inside. And so that's the minimum. Yeah. So I was going to mention that it's interesting to see how things have come full circle, you know? That because really people do want to go out, but if they're bounded by their hotel contract and they need to use the F and B minimum, we we've gotten very creative. And then we like to think that we were the first U.S. city to invent food trucks. We have over <laughs> two thousand. <laughs> well, some, some people claim it's San Diego or Portland, and uh, we have over two thousand food truck permits here in Austin. And out of that, and we don't have enough streets, obviously, to hold all those. But no. we again recreate it bringing the food truck experience into the hotel. Since the hotels have heard it loud and clear that people want that local Austin authentic experience, 
they have been more willing to let us bring in outside. Yeah. Well, and I think sometimes it really is just about that, that partnership and finding those things. So now we should let you know that the, um, there is lots of people, people who are listening can ask questions in lots of ways. So we have people saying hi. So can you just like, hi, Cindy Babson to hear us or she's not properly joining us. Um, and then something about a zoo. We could use a zoo as a venue. Yep. Yes. It's well, true. We said we, that. Yes. I, we actually have, I have. had a, I had a client here in Amsterdam, the Royal Zoo, I did a big project for. And they're not only, they're cultural heritage building as well and a zoo. So they were actually a unique and unusual building in the building. Uh, and you can have dinners in between the aquariums with all the fishes. And yeah, it's very, I mean, yeah. So I, I, that's what I said. Anything can be a yeah. venue here. Yeah. The latest trend that I've been seeing, at least from the executive level, is they will ask us which CEOs live in town and would they be open to having, assuming the group is a kind of within a reasonable size, having their dinner party at that house. So for example, like if there is a, a very famous CEO in town or even just a nice home that's as long as it's, um, it's you know, it's, it's luxury, lux, you know, in the luxury market and we have some store behind it they will ask us, can we rent it out and do our dinner there? Because they don't want, again, something that you can just Google and rent off online. And so we have a list of these um, properties in, in internally that we work with. Yeah. And I think, you know, you, we're in a really interesting time. So, you know, you are what is, you know, primarily has been a destination management company. Yeah. And, you know, it used to be my, a lot of my career has been spent in the DMC world. And so, you know, certainly 25 years ago, that was, you know, our secret back pocket mm -hmm. database was the most important, most valuable thing. And then Google came along and ruined it all for, a, for all of us. Um, it's made it very challenging. Because, but I think that, you know, I, I, I actually could do a whole diatribe just on this, but I think that we, um, the, the thing about uh, the difference between a destination management company or an event professional or working with a group like Sequoia is understanding not just what the venue tells you on Google. It, they, if your venue doesn't look good on its website, then you actually have a much bigger problem. Uh, it should look great, but the problem is, is that, that I don't think lying is too strong of a word, <laughs> but you know, quite often we find that venues exaggerate capacity or you don't, um, what can sometimes be opportunities can also be limitations. And as event professionals and venue professionals, it's our job to know what is the, what is, what are the ideal group sizes for my venue? What are the best ways that they flow through? What are the things that are going to make this um, venue successful from a group perspective? I think that's really important. And I think it's something that, you know, again, when you look at, you know, whether it's your hotel partnering with you, to create an alternative space or alternative venues, um, really digging deep into what works is so important. So what are some, maybe some of the things that you have found have really worked? Um, and again, from both of your perspectives to bridge some of those gaps between expectations and realities. Who do you want to start? Bass, do you want to go first or? Sure. Um... Well, I tell venues to be very honest, I think, with uh, what they do, do, uh, they know and don't know. So instead of trying to um, uh, um, make an educated guess whether something would fit through the door, maybe mm -hmm. they should check, double check. Uh, and I think at the same time, I think event professionals or DMCs should be aware of the fact that, you know, if it's not a standard ballroom, logistics aren't mm -hmm. going to be it's the way it's always going to be. The building was not built with that in mind. So to also double check um, and ask a lot of questions to make sure that you know what to expect if you're doing build up or breakdown and that you might need some additional time and, you know, to make sure that you have crossed your eyes and uh, dotted your eyes and crossed your T's and it's not the same as using a hotel ballroom. But I, what I found interesting is actually a lady from a car company, an event manager said, she, you know, she said, I went to a venue and they, we wanted, it was the perfect venue, but the car didn't fit through the door. And she said, I was so desperate to use the venue, but the venue said it didn't fit. But instead of being really creative and saying, well, we could take out the whole glass window, like a huge glass window, just take it out. Um, instead of saying, well, let's, let's uh, see if we can, we can do that. 
the venue said, no, it won't fit. So at the end, the, she herself said, but can't we just take out that huge window? Because that would be big enough to fit in the car. So also to understand if, if there's enough budget and the client wants it, then, you know, maybe somebody will go above and beyond. You know, as you said, you created a whole street <laughs> in a ballroom. <laughs> you know, if you want it, then people will pay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, to keep looking for solutions, I would say. I, I love exactly what Bab said. I mean, that second part, I cannot stress enough. I think that's what we've become known for in Austin because a lot of times people will come to us and they've already chosen the venue because maybe they learned about us a little later. And um, then they share with us all their expectations. And when we go through it, we go, wait, you know, um, you know, yeah, like, for example, the car, there's a, there's a little bit of a left there. And so unless we have a ramp, the car actually can't go up the, uh, so it might fit through the door, but it actually can't get up the patio. And they're like, oh, I didn't think about that <laughs> or you know, things like that. And so um, we ended up, this car was light enough, thank goodness. Uh, we ended up hiring six heavy lifting men to lift the car up and move it into the ballroom. Um, but, but yeah, I, um, I, I cannot stress enough that as an event professional, you must see the site if for those that are especially the, the, the more unique and challenging, if it's not just a speaker and, you know, and, and just rounds or tables, and then there's a little bit of more of a production and lighting needs and, and security, I think it's so important to see the space yourself. You can't just rely on a floor diagram or a CAD drawing and just word of mouth because, the, or, you know, email exchanges, because unfortunately there is a lot that can uh, get, get misinterpreted and uh, we even found one time when we were working in a venue that their measurements were actually off. So we used the measurements to, uh, and we used our, our CAD software to lay out the tables. But then the day of, we were like, these tables aren't fitting. And we were like, what did we change, guys? And we realized that the diagram that they had sent us was wrong. It was actually a little bit, the width of their room was unfortunately a little bit uh, uh, narrow or uh, shorter. And, and that meant we had to get creative immediately before the doors had to open, of course, to the general session and figure out, you know, what's our plan B because we literally had met, done everything based on this CAD drawing. And now we were, we were, um, we were not able to execute plan A, you know? And so that's why I always say double check everything just because it's, it's going to save you all the preparation in advance. It's going to save you that headache on site when you have to go into plan B or C mode, you know? And it wasn't your fault. And they, did, and they didn't know. I mean, it would be as it was a new hotel. They didn't know. They, they gave us a drawing, you know, and they told us the measurements. We trusted it. We plugged it in our system. We drew. We, 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 met, we went through all the options of the client. Everyone was happy. And, and then day of, uh-oh. <laughs> it was a scramble. But we made it work. <laughs> That's what we do. That's the great thing about it, right? It's just, yeah. Ooh, I know. So I think that there, yeah, there's that for sure. Um, you know, how do you get things that are accurate or sometimes they're accurate. The event I did last week, you know, we had the drawing done and you know, we had a huge room and lots of people. So we had a lot of flexibility with it, but literally where we had our very two front tables, they're like, oh, you actually can't put your tables there because that's you have floor ports there that are emergency floor ports. So you can't have anything there. What? <laughs> so, yeah. You know, that can so strike those two VIP tables. We'll just move it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and in our case, not such a big deal, but if the room had been at capacity that, you know, it kind of becomes oh, a very challenging, um, challenging experience. So what are some of the things, um, you know, besides sort of the, the obvious, you know, it feels right. Um, when you're working with their clients, what are they looking for in venues? You know, are they looking for them for, um, you know, and this is more of a little bit of a Cindy question, but are they looking for alternative venues to enhance a program or are they looking for alternative venues to host an entire program in? Um, I saw that question and right now we are definitely finding that there's a mix. So if they're more of the startup kind, entrepreneurial kind, they are actually asking for more, um, where they can host the event in a non-traditional setting, but if they still want some of the hotel amenities in the sense of, I don't want my breakout rooms to be too far. So if we have to, you know, buy out four venues, can they be like next door to each other? And, and that gets tricky because depending on how many people they have, not every bar next to each other are going to be the identical, you know, even though they like the idea of having a bar setting and a, and a surrounding, you know, um, but definitely the offsite parties, they always want to use something local. And here's the other thing I, I do laugh about. 
they want the unicorn event venue, which is half indoor, half outdoor. And it, it, in case it rains or it's too hot, we can all move inside this exact same seating. And I'm like, well, not one of those exists in town. <laughs> so either you have a lot more outside and, and little inside or vice versa. <laughs> there is not one that is exactly 50-50. And that's the challenge is that they want always, of course, the ideal rain backup plan that doesn't cost additional money, which I, we mentioned earlier is a tent. <laughs> and and <laughs> sometimes setting up a tent is, is, is the price of a small um, a small house, a small cottage. Yeah. And so, and in Austin, we have to pull permits. And so oh, yeah. it's, yeah. it's, you know, every, everywhere you go, you have to be careful that you, you're doing all the, all the, uh, yeah, legal, the permits and stuff. So um, in general, corporate clients are definitely wanting uh, to not be in one space at the same time. So even if it is in a hotel, what we, they have asked us to do is, is change it so that from morning to afternoon, somehow it got, it's kind of, it, there's just a, even a little bit of a different feel. So it doesn't feel like they're going into the same space because they want them to re-energize and, and feel different. And that's why there's been so many more unique setups. It's not just about the rounds, the crescent rounds or the classroom tables with the chairs. It's lounge seating, or maybe it's even uh, what I call a U-shape. And then you have like a, a little cocktail table in the middle. So it's not really big enough to eat food on, but there's something you can put your phone on, you know? Yes. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's fascinating to me how, you know, what, whether we're in traditional or alternative venues right now, how it's really about what I call happiness and positive surprise. Yes. So that idea that as we come into those venues, which is where alternative venues are so important, because as soon as we walk into a beige room, set theater, set <laughs> classroom, our brain shuts down like, ah. yeah. you know, like, I know that I'm here to learn. I know that I've spent <laughs> however many hundreds of dollars to be at this conference but now I'm not really that interested in the learning because it's just not an interesting environment. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're seeing a lot of those, you know, a lot of those things. And also um, when we start to get into, you know, more evening and more gala events, you know, that we're starting to see less of the, you know, traditional rounds of eight or rounds of 10, which, right. which frankly are useless to have a conversation at, mm -hmm. you know, we all sat at those tables. Yes. You can't talk to the people across from you. So you just hope, like, I hope that I'm sitting with <laughs> your Babs at those events. And Babs and I have been at an event where we were told to move and we didn't move because we, <laughs> 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 we sat at that table. We're there, we, no, 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 no. We like the people sitting on either side of us. You can't make us leave. So I think that, that also becomes part of that sort of yeah. beige room experience, right? So the, um, you know, when you, so when you have these, you know, these great alternative venues, you know, what, what, what are the ones, Babs, that you're finding that you guys are working with? What are the, what are the qualities that are making them stand out and making the clients want to be in them? Um, I think in, well, if I look at the European and the Dutch market, there's yeah. so many options uh, that I see that a lot of them do decide to see if a venue enhances um, the brand event that they're holding in the corporate. So, you know, if it's a tech company, they want a, you know, factory look kind of a more creative environment to have their conference in and, you know, and keep the energy up and then have food trucks outside and just have a much more creative environment. And so I think a lot of times they, um, they're looking at these kind of spaces to enhance what they're trying to, the look and feel from their brand perspective as well. Um, uh, yeah, there's just so many options in Europe, and I think, uh, and, and in addition, I think uh, when you look at some of these old buildings, there's also the, it's great to turn a ballroom into a street, but how cool is it just to have the venue be the venue itself and use some lighting and some, a lot less production to make the space look really different, uh, you know, and I think that's the advantage, well, that's the advantage as well, that it could save a lot of production costs, a lot of, because you can just have it be as it is. And, and the venue itself is, is, has that quality to add uh, that look and feel to your, to your brand. Until like as Cindy, you know, alluded to earlier, you know, when you have somewhere that's a great venue that people love, like, but then all of a sudden you can't close the street, you yeah. know, I think that, you know, and we see that here, you know, during, in Vancouver, the, during the Olympics, we had a lot of street parties and street closures. And when MPI came here in 2010, we closed the street for them. 
And I remember at the time feeling a little angry that they were closing the street because I, I said, you know, we're never going to actually be able to do this for our own <laughs> groups. So it's awesome that they've you know, shown this promise. But I also understand from a, you know, from a city perspective, you know, as much as these alternative venues are, are amazing, it's also they're generally quite often there for the public good, right? So when you start to look at those museums and some of the venues that, that you're working with, Babs, where they're, you know, more public venues during the day, um, yeah. you know, we run into some of those challenges of now, you know, and you know this, Cindy, like all of a sudden you have oh, yeah. two hours to flip a venue. Yes. <laughs> And they want to know why you have, you know, hired a hundred staff to do it and why that's so expensive. Well, because I have two hours yeah. to do that, which goes back to last week's episode on client expectations. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> um, you know, it's, it's true though, right? So how do we, how do we make that happen? So now we know groups come in all sizes. So are you finding, you know, that there's, and obviously you both work, you know, with all different sizes of groups and venues. So, but are you finding that, there's all sizes of groups who really want alternative venues or are you finding that people really understand if I have 2000 people, it's difficult to find an alternative venue or. Uh, I will answer this one. In yeah. Austin, they definitely still want an alternative venue. And here's why Austin, you know, Texas is big land. So they may want a ranch instead, but then when I tell them how far we have to bus out, because think about it, we're in a city and they, 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 <laughs> Texas, like I ride a horse to work and, and I have to tell them, no, I drive a car. <laughs> so, and so we, yes, we can take you to a ranch, but it, we have to bus everyone. And then once they do the math for 2000 people for busing, they're like, oh, that's not, that's not in our budget. Um, but I, I would love to share an experience that we, we had the same challenge because it was actually for PCMA. They came in. So PCMA is obviously an industry association. They came to Austin in January, 2017 that they were anticipating somewhere between six to 7,000 people to attending the opening night party. I think in the end it was right at 5,000. So, but we were planning for the six to 7,000 just in case. Um, and think about it. We're Austin. Where do you, there are very few venues within walking distance of the convention center and it can't be the convention center because they're already using that, um, that can hold that many people, but yet they still want it unique. So what we did is we actually transformed it. It's called Palmer Event Center. And we actually uh, transformed it into the four uh, most popular festivals in Austin. Wow. So when they through it, they experienced all four festivals as they walked through it. So it was, it was an experience from the time they entered the, 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 the Palmer Event Center all the way around. And we had rotating musicians to kind of tie into the theme. So, so that's how we decided to give them that authentic experience, the alternative venue, even though traditionally, uh, it, the Palmer Event Center is a traditional venue, actually, if you, if you, had, if you really put pen to paper. It is a mini convention hall. And, uh, but again, for that many people, how do you give them that same authentic experience without, uh, and they said the same thing, kind of like, the TV, they go, do not do something that I can't come and recreate, because think about it, PCMA is, it is an event for meeting planners. So they were like, don't sell me something. Don't do something that I can't come and recreate since we have conventions anywhere from as little as 500 all the way up to 20,000. And, and we, and we understood that. And so that's why we, we did what we did. And, um, but I think that that's really important too, right? Because as much as Bob, you were saying earlier, as much as we want the venues who's, who can figure out a way to say yes to the client that desperately wants their venue, there are sometimes also practical realities, like we can't take out a giant window that, you know, that needs <laughs> yes. to be dealt with, you know? Yeah. And I think there's some, you know, I have some like amazing stories. I have one of my favorites was we were putting a tent up in Whistler and it was, you know, it was a very, very high end program. We had two funny tent experiences with it. So the first one was in Whistler and it was beside this, it's beside a lake and it's in between a lake and a forest, a very small lake and a forest. And there's a public pathway that goes by it, but in the lake, there was these little tiny frogs that are the size of my thumbnail. I'm not kidding. But where we were putting the tent was on there when they went from tadpole to frog, there are forest frogs and it was on their migration path. So the entire ability of us to set up the tent and do the event was going to be based on when those frogs decided to hatch and migrate. Oh. <laughs> I've never spent more time with a woman in a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> we're just waiting like just watching waiting for frogs to hatch I mean it was just it was like like daily daily check-ins on the frogs and wow. you know when we were doing the site visits 
as we got really close because we, we couldn't set it up unless it actually migrated you would literally put your foot you'd hold it you'd watch all the frogs move you'd put your foot down <laughs> as you were going through the site it was just it was crazy it ended up they did migrate in time it worked to our benefit because they actually hadn't opened reopened up the public pathway so but it was very it was touch and go by a day and then on the same program a little bit later on in the program we were doing a large event down at the by the convention center and it was beautiful as August. And so there was, you know, it was a fire and ice event. We we're lighting the cauldron for the fire, very spectacular, um, you know, fake ice rink where there was Teflon ice rink, ice skaters, very exciting. And then there's gonna be a large tented event for the dinner and then farther down, a, you know, a band over the harbor, fabulous. Well, the client decides the day that we're putting, supposed to be putting in the tent, she doesn't want it for the dinner. And so we go through all the process of, because we need to have still have tents for all the food prep area. People can choose to take their food out and eat it where it's not covered, you know, cause we do have birds here and everywhere, um, but it has to all be prepped underneath. And so permits, we go back to permits, the city inspectors, you know, they're, so the city inspector is a lot of tent installation. So the city the inspector comes down and all of the other tents are set up except for the big ones, Friday, Friday afternoon, and fetches on Saturday. She's just said, well, I, I, where's this tent? I said, oh, the client decided not to use that tent. Well, I don't know what to do about this. I'm going to have to go back to the office. I'm coming back here on Monday. I'm like, okay. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? The event's like, we're going to be totally gone by Monday, but okay. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, so there's always like all these funny things that happen, right? So all these little challenges you can't expect. My favorite thing about that event was the client arrived and they said, so just so when our guests arrive, you know, there's a few, you know, two or 300 of them. Um, I just want to make sure I know where the cords are so I can tell them not to, you know, so we can avoid that area. And I said, there's no cords in the event space. So the technical crew had set up every cord outside of the event space. It was oh, spectacular. Awesome. I was just like, this is, you know, when I love my suppliers so much because they are the partners that you can't live without. Amazing. So, you know, it's crazy. So what are some of the other key challenges? <laughs> There's some I've encountered. What are some of the other key challenges that you suggest event planners look for? So maybe let's start with Babs about some of the things that when you're working with venues, what are the sort of things you're giving them as guidelines? And then I know Cindy, you're going to have a million stories too. So. Oh, well, I think so, some of the things we've covered, I think uh, particularly floor plans that might not be correct or they, you know, great to have a cat drawing, but I think a lot of the unique and unusual venues in mm -hmm. Europe probably don't even have that program. So that, you know, they're just relying on, uh, I think floor plans are, uh, they're not as professional. I think um, uh, some of the internal communications, so an example, and I'm not gonna mention the venue is that when in Amsterdam, they were arriving by boat and they were gonna have, they were gonna arrive on a terrace and then have a drink and then continue within uh, uh, the unique venue to go to dinner. Uh, but the um, internally, they hadn't communicated that they had taken out the terrace that morning. So it was all <laughs> sand because they were refurbishing the whole terrace. Oh. So first the sales manager came in the morning and says, wait a minute, there's a group arriving by boat. You know, <laughs> we're going to have a drink on the terrace. Where's the terrace? <laughs> so, oh you know, and, you know, then you have to also think, okay, we need to just cover the space. And, you know, they, they found some flooring that they could put, uh, you know, it wasn't going to be the same. And, of course, the client, luckily, the, the, the client was flexible as well. But, you know, that's probably horror. And I don't think that happens every day. But I think <laughs> the venues that are not focused on, you know, in, in, in Europe or at least in Holland and, I, well, a lot of Europe, Lots of the cultural venues are depending on the commercial side for the income to continue to do, uh, you know, to, to, to stay a museum and to, to, uh, to, to continue to be a zoo and to, mm -hmm. you know, they're, uh, to pay for all the cultural programs they put on, but they're not, so they're so focused on that, that they're just not, you know, they're not, they don't have eye for detail and they sometimes don't know what uh, can have, what a consequence would be if they don't communicate these you know, kind of refurbishments internally that that could have big consequences for events. So, um, uh, and I think that's something that, well, event, I don't think that happened. That's probably one of the rare things I've seen that have happened, but it can happen at, a, at some of these venues where, uh, and I think it's sometimes frustrating for these sales, 
you know, the sales and operational people, they have those internal challenges to deal with as well, because some of the, you know, the rest of the organization might not understand what they're trying to do for their clients. Now, in addition to, oh my gosh, to all yours, I can only imagine what happened with that voting when that sounds, that sounds yeah. painful to, to fix on site. Um, yeah. What, I, what we have found is that if it is a first time um, event, either of that size or even just event in general for a new venue that doesn't normally do these venues, we do go through a lot. We ask them a lot of questions about how they staff because things that we have gotten very spoiled by when you go into a traditional venue, for example, who, pour, who does your porter? So how often are the bathrooms cleaned? How often are, are, uh, are things restocked? Little things like that that they may not have thought about. Um, it, it tells us if we have to increase staffing on our side. Because in the end, when a corporate client hires us, we take that responsibility, especially if we recommend at the venue, that we understand that they are trusting us, that we have covered all of our bases. So if it's everything from valet staffing all the way to down to porter uh, staffing and, and making sure that the, everything is, is restocked and it works as, as is, we need to make sure that we have plenty of that staff because a lot of times when we are going into a home or a non-traditional venue, um, they usually do not think of that because they, they will just give us one person because that person's there really to unlock the door and lock the door, making sure that we don't, you know, stay. And, and I'm like, oh, no, this event's much larger. We need a lot more help. And when we go through all that during the contract phase, that's when we decide, is it us staffing it or is it them staffing it? Because we're okay with them charging us for it. We just want to know who is actually staffing it. And, and the same thing goes with the catering. If they make us do, um, use a caterer that is through them, we will ask the same question. How many people are you staffing? Because Again, if, if it's an off-site caterer, I need to make sure they understand how far the walk is from the back of the kitchen to where the people are. How often are you replenishing the food? How often are you, how easy is it even to refill the ice? Because in Texas, it melts so fast and everyone wants a cold drink. So it's just little things like that because they, you would be amazed at how many, they're like, oh, I, I already put three people. And I'm like, oh, three people's not enough. <laughs> like <laughs> you need a lot more because we're going to be, we're going to be, you know, doing a, ha a reception that's going to be uh, full on. I mean, it, because we're taking them here and they're going to just be here all at once. It's not a, like a, a small flow, you know? So those are the things that we typically focus on is because we are very concerned about the things that they don't think about, you know? And we okay. want them to be successful. There's the whole front of host side of it, that whole like staffing, who's going to take your coats? Where does your, you know, is the ice going to be cold? But then I think there's also the whole back of host side of it too. And I, you know, when you get into you know, any venue, you know, where, where's your loading access, how, you know, and which is certainly something you're going to see, you know, not every event is a castle that has, you know, sort of an endless amount of bays you can go into. Um, most are the opposite of that. So, you know, and again, just making sure that, you know, we understand, our suppliers understand, you know, that if we tell you a scheduled time, that there's actually a reason for that, you know, or, you know, I did an event last week and I got a call from the supplier who said, where's the loading bay? And I said, you know, I, I actually don't know because, but what I do know is that they've moved it because mm -hmm. their normal one is unavailable. I said, so I said, the building's not that big. Just look around for where you see that catering truck because that's where you're going to load in. <laughs> like, that is terrible. Like I should know that answer. But I think it's also, you know, those are the kinds, that's exactly the kinds of things like no. Why is there no terrace that we don't always communicate as venues because either we don't know or because we're just not, um, it's not on our priority list, right? Oh, I should, maybe, maybe I should remember to tell the client that. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So some of those I things. Th I think it's probably you, because you you do so many events and so many venues that, that have all the logistics in place, you sometimes mm -hmm. make a lot of assumptions. And I think with, you, you know, alternative venues, assumptions might be, quite dangerous you know yeah. it's better to double check and ask again you know especially with, you know exa exactly with logistics where's a loading dock or mm -hmm. staffing or you know how much build-up time do I have do you, do you let us you know do I have overnight access yes or no that's probably mm -hmm. not always uh, something that's uh, uh, possible uh, I worked for a zoo and you know people assume oh I'm branding my event I can just brand from the moment oh, I get yeah. into the zoo no, 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 because all the animals go crazy with all these flags and colors and, you know, so 
to, you know, to make sure that you don't assume things can be the way they are because, you know, that you can run into surprises on the day itself if you haven't checked. And, you know, I think the venues are trying to be upfront with information as much as possible, but also they don't know necessarily know what you're, if you don't communicate what you're going to do, they can't anticipate on telling you whether that's possible or not. Well, I think now, you know, we're certainly in a different time um, than even 10 or 15 years ago on our ability to do, you know, a, an infrastructure overlay um, digitally and to share that information and to have, you know, Google documents where we can show load and schedules to the entire team. And I'm not sure we're always using those things effectively, but I think that the tools are there. So now it's just, you know, if it is the next step in the industry to create more open, you know, and there's we've seen a lot of platforms for this, but more open communication um, each time, right? So that we can address some of those issues ahead of time. So let's talk about technology. Let's talk about power and Wi-Fi and alternative venues. <laughs> Any challenges? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, was I bet you have better ones as you have older venues, but uh, lately what I've noticed actually in Austin is if it's a brand new structure, um, and maybe you'll just know how amount of concrete they're using. We, we actually can't use our cell phones. So if we discover that during the site inspection, um, you know, we, we, when we do our normal um, pre meeting where we send out the, what we call our vendor confirmation emails, I've asked the team, please state at the very top cell phones do not work here. So if you're trying to reach me that day, that day, you need to do this. And this is the only way you'll be because the problem is, is that we have become so reliant on our cell phones and you can text me like, oh, I'm running 10 minutes later. Oh, I'm at the dock. Where do I go? It's very hard when you realize you really have no access to your cell phone. Once you go into what I call the pit <laughs> and you become blinded. And so, um, so that's a challenge. And then not all venues have free Wi-Fi, So then we have to bring it in. That's costly. And, uh, oh, and I, I should share one since this is on, this probably fits the best on the question. When we have outdoor venues, um, we have to be mindful of who our neighbors are because if they report it to our city of Austin and it really does violate the sound ordinance, then uh, they actually get, uh, the, I think the first one's a warning, but then the second one is they, they will never be approved for uh, event permits, you know? So it's like that they basically are hurting themselves for future events if, if they continue to go down that path, you know? So understanding why you can only have an acoustic player versus a live band. And because sometimes that's very hard for a client to understand, I'm like, no, I'm willing to pay. And I'm like, well, no, we're not allowed to have a band here. <laughs> There's neighbors right here next door to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think one of the challenges, well, with big, well, the, those big factories and thick walls is that they will always have a challenge with Wi-Fi. You know, they really, I think some of the venues have tried, you know, all these different options, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's just really hard to get the Wi-Fi through these old spaces. And some of the factories that have very big challenges because it's a huge space, mm -hmm. um, heating is a oh. challenge. So uh, in the winter, using a factory building that's quite old with high ceilings is very hard to heat up. And some of the, uh, because the heating costs are so high, mm -hmm. they charge people, well, the, the, the client. So yeah. uh, those are probably costs that you might not expect up front and uh, could uh, be a big surprise at the end because mm -hmm. uh, those heating costs can, you know, if they're do using diesel generators or whatever, because mm -hmm. they, you know, yeah, it can be very expensive. So those are things I think within uh, costs wise that are challenges as well. So the nice thing is, is that if it's summer and it's a, a big building with thick walls, it'll stay cool and you don't need air conditioning. So <laughs> that's then the advantage. So. Well, I think that's, you know, there's no client who's going to be happy with an $8,000 surprise bill. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it's um, understanding what those costs are up front, I think yeah. is really important. You know, it's just, yeah. yeah and and they, those costs add up very, very, very quickly. Um, you know, or we'll get venues that say you can't bring in your own Wi-Fi routers, but then they want to charge you $15,000 for yeah. Wi-Fi. Well, that's not reasonable. You know, it shouldn't cost me the same to put in Wi-Fi for my 10 booths that it costs me to, you know, 
basically give Wi-Fi to my neighborhood for a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, those are, those are real challenges, right? Or every time you go to plug something in, it's, you know, a hundred dollars. Um, those are real costs that, you know, I think most event clients will understand that you need to bear, but they can't mm -hmm. be surprised. Those have to be the things that venues are really upfront about at the beginning, because it's, yeah. you know, like you said, Cindy, you don't mind paying for the extra staff, but you need to really understand what that staffing is and what it's going to cost and to be able to justify it to your client. And, and also to, you know, when people come back with, you know, what are really sometimes unreasonable costs, you know, it's like, I don't think just because I'm having somebody start at 7am on a Sunday, because that happens to be an event day that that cost should be double because if your right. venue is open, yeah, <laughs> you know, this is, well, this has to be, you know, fair cost of doing business. And those are all become, become things that go into it. So you now you're going into venues that are, you know, obviously we have a lot of companies now that are technology companies in the world, mm -hmm. or really, I, you know, I would say that any company is a technology based company. So now we have clients who are expecting not only seamless power and good Wi-Fi and a certain level of production value. What else are you seeing that clients are expecting from technology? Uh, engagement, interactive. And Tough useful. there's no Wi-Fi. Yes, and useful, <laughs> and interactive. It can't just be there like to be white noise, if that makes sense. It's usually, it has to be practical. And, and so that way they feel that the investment was justified. Yes. And those are things that are, that's a tricky thing in an alternative venue, isn't it? So yeah. where you're sometimes doing that. So now Babs, you and I met originally um, doing at, at a green meetings industry council meeting. So um, we know sustainability is really at the core for you um, to your DNA of planning. So how do you tie this in your work that you're now doing with alternative venues? Um. So, well, I think it, actually in Europe, I think some of the alternative venues are a great way to give back socially. So they might, some of them have a great sustainability that. program, uh, but some of them don't. But a lot of them, because they are um, um, a theater, a local theater uh, that, uh, that, well, that uses the commercial money to give back to do cultural programs for the city, for its inhabitants. Uh, for example, the the Royal Zoo artist is uh, is also um, uh, uh, well. They they also all the money goes back to the animals and taking care of the the cultural heritage buildings that are there. So it's actually a way to give back to the local community as well by using these buildings because of the fact if you're using it as an event venue and spending money there they will be able to turn around and have a great theater production there for local the locals to go to. So I actually think it kind of ties very much into the sustainability. Like uh, I think some of them have a lot of challenges because they're, you know, uh, if you're building a new convention center, it's great to have a, you know, uh, um, have us everything sustainable from the way it's been built to green power to solar panels. And, you know, some of these alternative venues, they, they, they're old and they have those challenges. So they, they might not be able to be as sustainable in the green way, but they socially, they can have a big impact on, on the locals, you know, the local community. I love that answer. Cindy, are you finding that this is on your client's radar? You know, it's interesting. Some are, but I'll be honest, it hasn't been, but in general, Austin's a pretty green city. So a lot of the new venues are built using recycled material, uh, sustainable material, maybe even recycling old property materials into the building, uh, like our city hall and our um, our Palmer Event Center that I mentioned in Long Center. They actually used the existing building and they they reframed it back in, so that way they try to minimize the, the amount of waste, so that they also could be LEED certified. And our convention center's green, so so there there, there are those ways. But I haven't actually received, and that's what's interesting to me. I don't know if it's because they've already chosen their city and they know that we are. We try to be as green as possible, but I've never received someone going, I will only look at these kind of venues that have, yeah. you know, so. Or even, I think that those kinds of destinations, I think you're right. It's interesting at what yeah. point, you know, I, at any Fortune 1000 almost company that you find, you know, if you look on their website, we're going to find, you know, corporate sustainability policies yeah. that are part of that, but how much of that extends to their events and how much of that are we now responsible mm -hmm. for? 
yeah. um, you know, as event professionals and how much truly is reliant upon the destinations and the venues for that. So, you know, like I know, obviously I live in Vancouver, they're, you know, on target to, they're trying to be the world, the greenest city in the world by 2020. Thank God we have competition because that mm -hmm. is not the race that you want to be alone in. Yeah. That's, you know, and there's amazing things I think happening around, around the world in, in this arena. So how do we, you know, then look at, you know, those different, those different venues, you know, like Salt Lake City, Salt Palace mm -hmm. is now covered in solar panels. And, but yeah, you're right. If you have an old castle or a factory or a zoo, you know, there's yeah. certain inherent things that go along with that. But I also, I think the social impact is really important in what you said, Babs, about, you know, how you can, you know, tie that into the alternative venues. And, you know, certainly I know, I remember in Washington, D.C., there's 115 Smithsonian's and all of them are free to the public. Wow. But that was the deal that was made when they got the grant to, um, to build those. And it came from Europe, actually, that money to build the original Smithsonian's because he thought Americans weren't smart enough or cultured enough. And so he was going to imbue that. Um, but the, the deal was that they always had to remain free. But I can tell you that if you do an event in one of those venues, it, it's pricey. But it's pricey because it goes back to actually supporting their existence. And... Yeah you also have the opportunity to be in, in beautiful venues. So what do you think, you know, we've talked about so many things, but if you sort of had to narrow it down to, you know, that one, one or two sentences of you should use an alternative venue because, you know, what are the, what, what's going to be the thing that's going to sort of tip people over the edge who maybe have only been thinking they're going to be in a ballroom. Maybe they're scared of alternative venues. I wouldn't say don't be scared, but I would say it kind of just reinvigorates you. And also it allows you to see, uh, see an event through different eyes. I mean, I love, I mean, from a planner side, I definitely love the challenge, but from an attendee side, I love to see as many new things as possible. So when I get introduced to a new venue, I'm, I'm super excited. Even if it may not have been the perfect venue for the event, it gets me out of my, you know, same routine. Yeah. I think it's just, Every alternative venue has its unique experience. And I think that adds, if it, it, it can add to the event in whatever way you it feel you fits, but it, it's memorable for the attendees. And I think, you know, and it raises that energy. And as you said, you know, you walk into a ballroom and it's the same setup and, you know, it's, n there's, there's no experience there it, and it lowers your energy. And I think, you know, walking into a zoo and an unexpected experience as well, because, you know, there are little surprises along the way. And, you know, if somebody arranges a, you know, a, a, a drink on a terrace and all of a sudden, you know, the, the elephant walks by or, or you're in a beautiful castle and you walk into this gorgeous room with chandeliers, it's just, you can't, although you would, you can do anything to try and reproduce it, it's not going to be same as the original. I think that's probably why you should consider those venues. Well, I think it's, you know, for all of us, we've been, you know, we've experienced um, as both planners and as attendees, that magic. And, you know, if I think of every event that I've been to anywhere in the world, it is those, as you said, those unique moments and those opportunities that you don't have just walking into a room and also that sense of culture. And I think as we get, you know, to an age now where everything is, um, you know, shared socially, how do yeah. we build the social capital of our participants? And if you can go somewhere that nobody else gets to go or see mm -hmm. something people don't really get to see, that's where the magic happens from, a, from an event perspective, because now people want to really talk about and share that experience. And that's what helps us build our FOMO for the next year. Whether that's an internal corporate event or an association event, it builds that FOMO for the next year and helps you really market what you're going to do next. So I think that alternative venues have a, really strong place in the value chain of events and that we really need to continue to embrace that. And, um, and I love the idea, Babs, I don't think a lot of people talk about the positive social impact of using their alternative venues, but if I think of the many places that I've been, that would apply to most of them. I think it's also an opp opportunity they uh, forget to tell people. I think they're all so much into the commercial side of it, trying to sell the space and what's possible and not that they forget to tell the story and where the, where their money, where the money goes from events commercially and what, what, what 
they can, what that brings back to the venue or what the venue can do with that. And I think they forget to tell that story nine out of 10 times. So really it's also probably an opportunity for venues to think about what's my story to tell. You know, if you're a cultural venue or a museum, what, what, how, how does that extra additional money from events matter to you? And what can you do with it that can social, have a social impact? Well, and that legacy, right? So I think that's one yeah. of the things, you know, that we're really everyone is now looking for as well is the, that we're hearing a lot about right now is how do I leave a legacy? And that is, that is a really positive way that we can leave a legacy. So it's not just a cost. It's actually something that is having that positive impact, which I think is really important. Well, you know, I always say that doing these shows, it's a little bit like a spin class at the beginning. You think, how will we fill an hour? And then at the end, you're like, how did that hour go by so fast? Yes. Oh my gosh, are we almost done? Oh, oh wow. wow. Done. <laughs> See, like that. So, all right. So if you could pick one tip, mm -hmm. what's your one tip that you have for event professionals? So if it is on the alternative venues, is that you decide once you've picked your venue, what's the one wow factor to because Honestly, I know budget's always a concern. There's very few unlimited event budgets. And make that, make sure you kind of make that the wow piece. And so that way, everything else can be more just subtle details that support it. And that's how I usually design an event. And uh, that way you're not stressed about, oh my gosh, I need this, I need that. And because it, it adds up. And, and you just got to be realistic. I love that. How about you, Babs? Oh, well, I just... Yeah, um, be creative and look at all potential alternatives. As I said, you know, especially here in Europe, there are so many different venues that you can look at from, you know, from a church and, you know, don't limit yourself and go see the venues, but make sure it fits. Don't try to, you know, do something in a unique venue just because it needs to be there and you want it to, but make sure it fits with the program and it, and it fits with your attendees and that it's the right story to tell. So um, don't do it because you feel you have to do something different. I think that makes total sense. So, all right. Um, and let's share some resources. So, you know, favorite website, obviously, Cindy, tell us about your book. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so if you are curious just how we use venues and just how we, how we think through our process of planning, definitely check out the book called Behind the Red Velvet Curtain talks about how I started in this industry and then how we got to where we are today. But for me, resources for venues and just even inspiration ideas. I love going to BizBash because BizBash is in multiple locations and I believe they're trying to spread out more internationally too. And they, they feature um, conferences too that have done a very unique job of, of using even uh, traditional spaces and how to transform them. And I, I love getting even just a glimpse of an idea there and then kind of spawning off from there. Um, Exhibitor Magazine is another one that's for trade shows type stuff. And then um, Event Manager Blog, I just like going there because I get a lot of ideas from it and just hearing what he has to say and or the different writers he has coming up. Um, it helps me out to kind of think through some things when I'm, I'm either planning or, or pitching a new idea to a client. You know, I totally agree. I think that there's, you know, what we do is very complicated, um, can't be valued enough and that we can't stop looking and being curious for resources. Um, thank you ladies so much. And I'm gonna pretend, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna use my big voice brand and do our big outro closing. You guys ready for this? So we are recorded live each Wednesday at 5, 5 p.m. Eastern. We watch behind the scenes on Facebook Live, which is just for fun. Um, it comes, it's gonna come out to you next Tuesday. It'll be on Facebook and iTunes and Pocket Cast and Stitcher, whatever your favorite podcast is. So event-icons.com has the show notes and links to all the resources shared. The best way to join is to uh, sign up at event icons or event-icons.com. And you can always every week join the chat live on Zoom. The only day that we won't be broadcasting this year is on July 4th, which is an American thing. Um, we totally want to know what you think. We really do. So you know, can tweet using the hashtag event icons, join the Facebook group. You guys can do that if you haven't yet. Um, let us know what else you want to hear about it. What other icons you want to have on the show every week is just, we've got just great people lined up for the whole year. So thank you, uh, Babs and Cindy. So it's always too long between times that I see you both. Um, and it was lovely to have a chance to catch up before and during the show. So thank you so much for everybody else. We will see you next week on event icons. 
thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch the transcription and all of the resources mentioned, head to www.helloendless.com slash blog. This week's episode will be posted and available by next Tuesday. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway and join the social conversation. Sponsored by Little Bird Told Media. Just tag your post with hashtag event icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on hashtag event icons.